Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, welcome to the stage in just a moment the person who will introduce our last morning speaker. And then just to remind everybody, we have a panel discussion this afternoon uh, that should be very interesting uh, with veterinarians that are sort of on the cutting edge of a variety of different kinds of things um, that are important for both domesticated animals and for wild animals. Also, a reminder that tomorrow we have uh, Expo over by the practice field for the football stadium. And once more, a thanks to Merck uh, for making it possible to get all these people here to do this really fantastic symposium. Uh, so right now I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Leslie Forrest. She's a senior psychology student who has been on the planning committee for this and has helped uh, keep me organized a lot of the time. Hi, thank you everybody for coming. Um, tonight's speaker is the director of the Comparative Cognition Laboratory in the Canine, Canine Cognition Center at Yale. She obtained her bachelor's degree in psychology and biology from Harvard University in 1997 and her PhD in psychology from Harvard in 2003. Since then, she has served as professor of psychology at Yale University and director of the Yale University Comparative Cognition Laboratory, as well as in the Canine Cognition Center at Yale. Her scientific research has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The New Yorker, and has been featured on the History Channel and the television show Brain Games. She has also won numerous awards, both for her scientific achievements and for her teaching and mentorship. She is the recipient of the Stanton Prize from the Society for Philosophy and Psychology for Outstanding Contributions to Interdisciplinary Research. She was recently voted as one of Popular Science Magazine's Brilliant Ten Young Minds and in the Times Magazine as leading campus celebrity. Please join me to welcome to the stage Dr. Lori Santos. Thank you so much. And, and first off, thanks to the organizers. When I got the invitation to this, it was like the who's who of the fantastic people in canine cognition and thinking about canine health. So I was super excited to join. But, to, but in the next hour, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. We've been talking about the genius of dogs and how the dog mind works. Now I'm going to ask what we can learn from dogs about how the human mind works. And in particular, what are the kinds of things that can make the human mind special. And what I'm going to argue today is that dogs can provide this really fantastic window into the kinds of things that make the human mind special. Because they grew up with us, they might be the best window we have into thinking about how human cognition works. And so just to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about today, I'll first by make the claim that humans are a particularly weird species. Um, Hal mentioned that humans are idiots. We'll get back to that later in the talk. Um, but I'm going to make the claim that humans are weird. And I'm going to claim that this, I'm going to make a new kind of proposal for what makes us weird. A lot of times we think about human weirdness in terms of what makes us so smart. Um, but I'm going to claim that humans are weird in part because we have certain things that make us a little bit idiotic. And uh, the, the claim I'm going to make is that one thing that makes us idiotic is we want to meld our minds with other individuals. We want to share our minds with others. And that's the kind of thing that we don't tend to see in non-human animals. And I'll walk through some early evidence on non-human mind melding that came from work on primates, one of the models we have of non-human animals because they're so closely related to humans. But then I'll argue that an even better model for this sort of sharing our minds with others might be dogs. And we'll look at some new work trying to ask, do dogs share the minds with us in the same way that humans do? And we'll kind of end with some big conclusions and some open questions. Hopefully, we'll have time for a little bit of discussion at the end. Um, but as I promised, I'm going to start with a strong claim, like humans are just super weird. Like super weird when you compare us to the rest of the species of the world. Because we do stuff that no other species on the planet does. You know, I'll click through just some things like teaching, like participating in fiction, thinking about fictional worlds, collaborating on scientific projects and politics. We have cultural practices like dance and science and all these things. Like in all these categories, we're just doing stuff that no other species does. And it's easy to take it for granted, but it just means that we're just kind of strange. And so the question is, why are we so weird? And in particular, because I'm a psychologist who studies cognition, what kinds of cognitive capacities make us so weird? Now, I'm not the first to ask this question. In fact, there, as I mentioned, there are lots of different proposals out there for the kinds of things that make us weird. But these proposals tend to have a bit of a flavor. Um, you, some of you may have seen some of these, like what makes humans unique? Here are some of the standard ones, language, symbols, theory of mind, tools, cooperation. You can kind of pick your favorite. But most other proposals out there have a certain flavor. And that flavor is that what makes us unique isn't like the fact that we are this interesting smart species, that we have some sort of special smart 
human cognitive capacity. That's what most of those proposals are, that we cooperate and we have language and symbols and so on. Today I'm gonna make a different proposal. Um, and that's one of the things that makes us glitchy is that we, one of the things that makes us unique is that we have certain cognitive capacities that are a little bit glitchy, or maybe even a little bit dumb. It's actually really nicely harkening back to Hal's point that like humans are idiots, and that was, might be the kind of thing that makes us special from animals. Um, and I'm gonna argue that this special unique thing um, is a little bit weird, and so it helps to have some glimpses of this dumb cognitive capacity in action. And to start that off, I'm gonna give you a bit of an analogy, tell you a sort of story about this glitchy cognitive capacity in action. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story about a very famous honeymoon that happened back in the day. Um, and so you'll bear with me, you'll see the story of the honeymoon playing out, this very glitchy thing that humans do all the time that might be the thing that makes us unique. And so this honeymoon happened way back in the day. We're gonna cut back to 1833, back in October, um, when this gentleman, William Henry Fox Talbot, was on his honeymoon. Anybody know what this guy was famous for? Show of hands. Okay, so don't, don't, if you know, don't spoil it. But Henry Fox Talbot was on his honeymoon, which is fantastic. He was this British guy, and for the first time, he traveled to Italy with his wife, um, to this spot, which is Lake Como, on the shores of Italy. It was so beautiful that this is a spot where George Clooney and folks like that have homes, right? Really gorgeous. But Fox Talbot was really upset the day that he was there. And he was upset because he was in this beautiful place for the first time with his wife, but he didn't have a way to share it with other people, right? This is 1833, there's no iPhone, you can't just snap a pic of your beautiful honeymoon spot. You just like can't share it. There's no technology. Well, there, that's, not a, that's not actually true. There was technology at the time. In fact, Fox Talbot had the best technology at the time. This was the camera Lucida that allowed him to kind of see an image through this mirror and he could sketch it on a piece of paper. This was like the iPhone 10 of the current, of the 1833 generation. And you can see he, he took a famous image of Lake Cuomo with this machine that actually is pretty good for a drawing, but he didn't like it at all. In fact, when he described it, he said it was a melancholy to behold. This is not what you want to say about your honeymoon pictures, right? But he thought this was terrible. In real life, he saw this beautiful thing that he wanted to share with other people, and this was the best he got. But it gave him an idea. He was thinking, you know, it's weird when I see through the image of this mirror and this technology I have now, it's like the pictures are sticking on the page. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could get those natural images to stick on the page durably, like to print something like a photograph? And that's why I asked you if you knew what Fox Talbot was famous for. He's famous for being one of the two inventors of the modern day photograph, um, the other inventor being Daguerre from Daguerreotype. Um, and so from those early images, he kind of came up with an idea of like, we could actually make photographic paper, we could stick things. That means that today we have technology that takes an image that looks like this and turns it like this, right? Why am I telling you this story? Well, it could be a story about human uniqueness of like our amazing technological invention, you know, seeing an idea and carrying it into the future. But I think a much more fundamentally human thing is at work here. Like Fox Talbot just saw some cool thing and wanted to get what was his, in his mind into other minds too. It's this urge that we all have to share stuff. And it's the urge that allows us to do the kinds of things technologically that humans do all the time, from sharing information on Wikipedia to sharing things on social media. We do this kind of thing because we want what's in our heads to go into other people's heads too. It's the foundation for most of our technology, but it's an interesting glitch that might be the kind of thing that makes humans unique. And so my claim is that if we wanna look at why humans are so weird, we might wanna look at this glitch. We're weird in part because we have this crazy and very automatic, I'll argue, tendency to wanna to get what's inside our heads into other people's heads too. And I've come up with a kind of fun term for this because I'm like a nerdy sci-fi buff. Um, I've referred to this kind of glitchy capacity as the human mind meld. Um, those of you who are fans of Star Trek might know where this comes from. Um, it comes from the Vulcan mind meld, um, which is what Mr. Spock did. I'm not sure if this video, this is a video of old school Star Trek. Our minds are merging, Doctor. Our minds are one. I know what you know. So when Vulcans do it, the Vulcan mind belt has lots of fanfare. You have to grab somebody's head and the weird 70s music plays and all that stuff. But the human mind melt doesn't require any fanfare. Like we're just constantly wanting to get what's inside our heads into other people's heads. It kind of happens automatically and without much fanfare, which means we kind of don't notice it all the time, but it can be incredibly powerful. And it's incredibly powerful in big art because data suggests that it's not just adult humans who want to do this. This tendency to want to share with others emerges really early in human development and without much uh, uh, tutelage, as it were. 
In fact, you can look at very young human children and see that even from within the first year of life, babies are wanting to share the kinds of things they see with other people. One way we know this is that babies follow the gaze of other people. They like to share information about something that's there. Um, just to see one study about this, this is by Brooks and colleagues here. If, you're, if you have your, uh, your own one-year-old child, you can look to some interesting thing in the environment and you'll probably find what these folks found, which is that kids, when they see you looking at some interesting object, they want to share that with you. They automatically have a tendency to gaze follow and to pay attention to what you're paying attention to. And the interesting thing about this emerges even further when it's not just where babies are looking, it's how babies are acting. They're actually pointing at stuff that they want you to see in the world. Now, it's important to recognize that babies have two kinds of pointing. One isn't about sharing information, it's about getting stuff. And scientists who study human development recognize this. There's sometimes that babies are pointing at things that they want you to give them. And researchers have a name for this. They call this a uh, proto-imperative point. So it's kind of a give me that point, which makes sense, you want to get stuff. But there's also a different kind of pointing that can be more powerful, which researchers call proto-declarative point. Seems like babies are pointing just to get you to look at something that they want you to look at, just to get everybody to share. And we know that it's about sharing in part from some cool studies by Mike Tomasello and his colleagues, which showed babies interesting kinds of things. So you have the stuffed animal pop out in the middle of the space there, babies will naturally point at it. And they had adults react differently. Either the adults reacted in a way that just did what they would normally do, where they look at the object and look at the baby and everybody shares and it's great. Or the adults did one of two things. They just looked at the baby and said, oh, that's great, but they never looked at the object. Or they looked at the object and was like, wow, what a great object, but they never shared back with the baby. And what you find is that in those latter two cases, babies over trials just basically stop pointing. What they want is for everybody to share everything together. And so this is this automatic tendency that I argue emerges early in humans. And it's also funny, in part, not just because it emerges so early, but the research suggests it's really glitchy. It has these features that we can't shut off, even when it's really dumb to be sharing with others. And I don't just mean like whipping out your Facebook and not paying attention at dinner. You know, that's a kind of glitchy way that we want to share when we shouldn't be. But automatically, we sometimes want to share in cases that we shouldn't. And so one of these sorts of cases is what researchers refer to as altercentric interference. This comes from work in cognitive psychology. It's a big word, but it basically just means that other people's perspectives are interfering with your own. And to illustrate this, I want to have you all be subjects in a study. Um, and so here's a sort of typical cognitive psychology task. What I'm going to do is on the screen, I'm going to flash a bunch of red dots. And your task is to, as quickly as possible, you have to yell out the number of red dots you see. So if I flash two dots, you yell two. If I flash three, you, flash, you yell three. Got it? I might also, because I'm a sneaky psychologist, put other stuff on the screen. But your task is to ignore that. All you have to do is yell out the number of dots. OK? Ready? Here we go. Okay, you guys are good at this task and showing a little bit of the phenomenon I cared about. You know, you might be wondering, why is that guy on the screen? Well, he's there to see how automatically you pay attention to his perspective. And if you were listening both to the speed at which people responded and sometimes the cases that people messed up, you might have noticed the phenomenon in question, which is that people are more accurate and faster when that guy on the screen is seeing the same thing as you are than they are in those cases. And you even heard it in some of your responses, people messed up a little bit more in that second kind of case than in the first kind of case. This is crazy because I told you to ignore this guy. And he's not a real person. He's just a two-dimensional guy on the screen. But you can't help but take his perspective. That's altercentric interference. And we see other kinds of cases that aren't just interference in adult humans, but interference that happens even in little kids. And we see this in the context of another phenomenon that's known as over-imitation. Um, Hal also mentioned that humans are very interested in imitating the kinds of things that other people do. But sometimes we do that too much. And that's this phenomena of over-imitation. And so here's a study that was done with four-year-old kids where you bring them into, uh, into the lab and you try to teach them how to open a puzzle box that should be kind of obvious to open because it's transparent, but you give kids some interesting information. So here's the puzzle box. You're trying to figure out how to open this thing there. And you probably, if you had to guess, would just say, well, you just probably yanked the red thing off because like, that's all there is. But you see somebody who teaches you how to open the box, but they do it in a really silly way. They use a stick to move this red thing at the top, and then they poke the stick into the top of the box. And then only after that do they do the really obvious thing, which is to open the red. If you're a child who wants to efficiently get a toy out, you just do it the efficient way, 
Turns out, no, you seem to copy all the bad steps that another person does. Um, even if the person tries to convince you that sometimes they mess up, it still show this effect. This is over imitation. We imitate too much, even when we shouldn't be doing it. But a final case that I find really compelling and one that we think was particularly interesting to look at in dogs as we get to that work is another phenomenon that kids show where they automatically want to trust the social cues that we give them, even when we teach them that those social cues are a little bit off. What do I mean by social cues? I mean the simple act of doing something like pointing, pointing to a location where there's food. So if you were in this study and you saw this guy point to that location, you'd probably have a decent guess of where the food was. But again, we're sneaky psychologists, and over trials you learn that in fact, the food is not in the cup he's pointing at, it's in the other one. Question is, can you learn this over trials? If you're a three-year-old child, the answer is no. Over trials, you just can't pick it up. You continue to search at the location that the guy is pointing at, and you can't override this cue, which is super interesting. But it's not just that you haven't figured the task out, because if I get rid of that obvious human cue, the pointing, this thing that means share with me, share with me, and I do something else, you have the person place a little marker on the cup instead. At first, kids do the same thing, where they'll go where you place the marker, they think like, oh, obviously you must be placing the marker for me to look there, but then over trials, they can figure it out, they can get it. There's something special and really automatic about pointing that we can't override. And it's true if it's one person pointing, or even in cases where there are two people pointing. Let's take this interesting case. So this is one trying to figure out if kids can recognize who knows the information when they're pointing. So imagine you're in the study, you see these two folks looking at these objects. Now some piece of food is going to get hidden inside that, those buckets, but this guy can't see it, the guy on the right can. So now you see the food go back there, and so the idea is you're probably tracking, well that guy knows where it is, this guy doesn't know anything. So when he looks back and they both point, question is who do you believe? Do you go with the guy that knows something? What you find is that little kids, even though they recognize who knows what information, when both individuals are pointing, even though there's one guy that knows and one guy that doesn't, they can't tell the difference between these two cups. They just perform at chance, which is kind of interesting. Interestingly, again, if they do this not with pointing but with these cues, now all of a sudden the kids can get it. They can track who knows the information there. All this goes to say that we're automatically copying other people's mental states, and when people give these cues, we can't help but sort of follow the kinds of things they're doing. This seems to be this glitchy part of our mind though, where we're just copying other people's behavior, even in, in other people's mental states, even in cases where we don't need to. And so it's really glitchy, but it raises this question, but is this one of the things that makes us do all those unique things I started with? Is this one of the things that allows us to be as special as a species? And researchers tested this first by using the population that a lot of comparative researchers go to, namely non-human primates. Um, I actually don't work with this non-human primate, I work with this non-human primate, which are rhesus monkeys. Um, these guys live on an island just off the coast of Puerto Rico, um, which is a really lovely place to go, filled with palm trees and so on and the monkeys free range around the island, and for the last 70 years they've been subject to research on the island, such that researchers can go down there and set up little experiments to sort of see how they make sense of the world. And this is the approach we use to start asking, okay, is this mind meld special to humans? Maybe this is the kind of thing we see in monkeys too. And so we first tried to test this by looking at that sharing other perspectives. Do monkeys want to share with what we're paying attention to? And we can do that using the simple sort of technique you saw with kids at the start, which is just to ask when we look at something, do monkeys follow our gaze? And they try to look at it too. This was work that I did um, with two students, Alex Rosati and Alyssa Airy. And we just did a really simple task. We would find a monkey who was hanging out on an island somewhere. We would walk up to that monkey and then look at it. And then all of a sudden we would look up in a shocking way. And the question is, did the monkey follow what we were looking at? Did they spontaneously look up also? And what we found when we do this, I'm plotting how often the monkeys look up, um, how many times they look upward. Um, what we find is that both adult monkeys and little kid monkeys will do this. In other words, on the trials where we look up, they're more likely to look up than the trials where we look down. That's just what that graph is showing. So they're tracking something, but they seem to want to share our perspectives, but do they want to do it automatically? Again, we can turn to non-human primates to get at this, and this is work that has been done, not from my lab, but in other labs looking at chimpanzees. This research tried to look at whether or not when you point at something, will chimpanzees follow what you're pointing at? And I wasn't here when Brian talked, so maybe Brian talked a little bit about this yesterday, but here's a spot where chimpanzees differ from dogs, because even with lots of training on this task, our closest living relatives are just not all that good at it. Like, it's not even so much that they automatically follow it. They can't follow it at all, it seems, even with lots of training. So it started to suggest that non-humans weren't automatically following it. And other researchers tried to test this by looking at that phenomenon of over-imitation. Do chimpanzees imitate too much? When they see us do something, are they compelled to follow it? 
This is what Horner and Whiten tried to test with chimpanzees. They gave chimpanzees the very same box that researchers use with human children and showed them the same thing. It's obvious how to open it, but you see somebody solving it in an inefficient way. Do chimpanzees copy? The answer is no. They're very, very rational. They ignore the dumb things that you don't need to do, and they just go get the food the most efficient way. All this goes to say that um, these animals, non-human primates, seem to not be copying these sorts of things that humans see. They might not be automatically processing the kinds of things that we do. I'll tell you one final study, and this was one where we tried to see if we could test monkeys on that very same study I just tested you on, where we wanted them to count the number of objects and to see if somebody else's perspective was messing them up. How do we ask whether or not monkeys on some island can count objects, you ask? Um, well, we do it in a very funny way, which is that we use uh, monkey magic tricks, um, which sounds even more crazy, but I'll explain kind of how we do that in just a second. Um, basically, what we do is we try to film monkeys' reactions to different kinds of events in the world. And so you might have a person uh, who's over there who's uh, acting as a magician. She's going to be putting objects into the box, and some of those objects are going to be disappearing. And then we can ask how the monkeys process that by having a camera person behind filming the monkeys to see if they show surprise. And the way we chronicle surprise is we just measure how long the monkeys look at these different events with the idea that if something magical happens, you might stare at that event for a really long time. Critically, we have the monkey there, who if you can't see him, he's up there. And we're filming and measuring how long the monkeys are gonna watch these events. And for decades, these kinds of studies have been used at the field site to try to test whether or not the monkeys can track simple numbers of objects. Um, this study was done back in the 90s. If you're a student in the room, this is before eggplants were funny on the internet with emojis. So we didn't know eggplants would be weird, but we did it with eggplants, so, so be it. But um, monkeys saw one eggplant added into a box, and while the uh, screen was placed down, a second eggplant was added to a box, and then when the screen was lifted, now there's two eggplants, right? So one plus one equals two. Can monkeys track that? Maybe, if so, that should be super boring, and that's what we find. When we look back at the videos, monkeys don't look for very long, they kind of look away. However, when you do a magical event, where one plus one now equals one, all of a sudden research shows that the monkeys show a different pattern of performance. Now all of a sudden they stare for a really long time. A uh, really long time is not actually that much time. Here's what the data really look like. Uh, when one plus one equals two is at the top, monkeys look for about a second at that event. But when one plus one equals one, or when one plus one equals three, they look for about three to four times as long. So all this goes to say we can track how many objects monkeys think are there, and when those things change, they show longer looking. Question is, what would happen in a situation like that? Basically, I just had the monkeys do kind of what you're doing. I asked them, how many objects do you think are there, just like I did with you? Does that get messed up when there's some agent in this scene as well? Do they show this same altercentric interference that we do? And so that's what I tested uh, with two other students, Lindsay and Alia. Here was the sort of setup we used. We presented monkeys with this little box where there could be one or two apples there, kind of like one or two red dots. And the agent on the screen wasn't a two-dimensional person, it was actually Alia who was watching one of these objects. And if you can see in this case, this is kind of a case where the monkey, like you guys, can see two, but Alia can only see one, right? And so we can do the same kind of thing with the monkeys that we did with you all. Here's the specifics of how we did it. We presented them a case that looks like this, where the monkey's seeing two over and over again, but you're only seeing one. And then we varied what happens. We either changed nothing, so this should be a really boring trial, it's exactly the same thing for the monkey and exactly the same thing for Alia, or we changed something for the monkey, so now one of these disappeared, but it didn't really disappear for Alia, she says the same thing, or we changed something for Alia, but not for the monkey, so if you're the monkey, you still see two, but her perspective has changed, and then we do the kind of big change where both change. Basically, the idea is if the monkey's tracking automatically what Alia sees, they should be faster when their perspective aligns with Alia's. Does everybody get the intuition here? Yeah? Okay, and here's just the nerdy graph of what we find. Basically, we find no big pattern of Alia. The monkeys look longer whenever their perspective changes. So if they saw two and all of a sudden they see one, they do look longer, but they don't seem to care what Alia thought at all. Basically, the monkeys aren't showing that same effect that you showed. All this goes to say that even though there are hints that, at least with their gaze, primates want to pay attention to what we're paying attention to, they're not anywhere doing like anything like the automatic way of mind melding that we have. And for a long time, folks thought that that meant, well, if our closest living relatives don't do anything like a mind meld, it must be special, it must be unique to us. But of course, if we're interested in this automatic tendency being unique to humans, we can't just compare humans with other non-human primates. There are other species out there that might be better models. Enter the domesticated dog, of course. 
Why might dogs be a good model for this? Well, we're already even just in the room with the service dogs and the dogs I see around seeing these behaviors. Dogs constantly seem to want to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. We interact with direct eye gaze. They seem to want to care about the stuff that's going on in our head. They're kind of like a little doggy version of Fox Talbot wanting to share in what we're sharing in. But do they show these kinds of phenomena too? Well, to test that, um, we turned to testing dogs. As you heard before, I work at the Canine Cognition Center at Yale. This was a purpose-built facility that we set up to test dogs from the communities who come in. It's very dog-friendly. Um, but just as in a lot of Brian studies, dogs come into the, the center, and then we can test what they know about the world using these simple kinds of experiments. Um, and this is just a plug for canine cognition research. It's fun for everybody involved. It's fun for the researchers. It's fun for the dogs. It's also fun for the dog's companions. Um, at Yale, dogs get little uh, certificates and degrees from Yale, so your dog can graduate from Yale too. Uh, companions are very proud when their dogs get into Yale. Uh, we actually have one companion whose, whose dog got into Yale, but their kid didn't. I'm like, I'm going to go home and tell my daughter. Like, she didn't get in, but <laughs> so it can be very embarrassing. Um, but what we've tried to do is to try to see whether or not we can test those very same studies with kids in dogs, to try to see if dogs want to represent and share our perspectives. And this is work that we've done, but work that other folks have done. And research suggests that, again, as you might expect, dogs, there's a lot of suggestion that they really want to represent and share our perspective, much more so than non-human primates. Um, in fact, some of this comes from early work showing how good dogs are at focusing on our gaze. This is just one study uh, by the Hungarian group, where you have a person look at a dog and then look to one of two locations without any any trainings, dogs do fantastic on this. They know to go to the one the person's looking at. Um, and as you probably saw in Brian's talk, dogs are not just good at following other people's looking. They are really, really good at following pointing, especially compared to our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. They're awesome at this. So already we're ticking off, hey, they want to represent our perspective, they want to share it, and they do it this really well. They also have cases where they look to our perspective when they need some information. So they assume that we might have the information we need. Um, we know this from a particular task by Adam Mc Loshi and his colleagues. This is a, a task known as the look back task, where in this uh, situation, dogs have been given a puzzle where they have to pull a tool to get food out of this little enclosure. They do that successfully on a bunch of trials, and then all of a sudden we make the task impossible. Dogs can't do it anymore. And the question is, what do they do? Do they just trial and error try to figure it out? Or do they realize if I share the perspective with the human, the human might know what's going on? Do they look back to the human for help? Um, and you'll see what McLoshi and colleagues have famously found. And dogs try it out for a little bit, but then as soon as they run into trouble, they'll look back to their owner, a smart person, who might be able to share her perspective with them to kind of help them out, right? It's like, why are you not sharing your perspective with me, right? So lots of hints from her work suggesting that dogs are doing this, but are they doing this in the same way that we are? Are they doing it automatically, right? And that's important, right, because we know that dogs are paying attention to the same stuff that we see humans paying attention to. They care about where we're looking, they care about direct gaze, they're following pointing, but is it the same? Are they doing it automatically? Can they not help it in the same way you couldn't help it in that case of altercentric interference? That's what we've been testing more recently. And this is a lot of, uh, with work um, done by Angie Johnston, um, who's a former student in my lab who's now just started up her own canine cognition research center at Boston College. And what we started with was those pointing studies with people to ask whether or not dogs automatically follow pointing cues in the same ways as human children. Remember, these are these studies where we give, uh, where in kids in this case were given information uh, about what individuals know. We try to see whether they automatically can't help but track it. And so just as a reminder, if you were in this study as a kid, you'd see these two people looking, a screen would come down, this guy would look away, and then you would see the toy hidden. You can't tell where it's hidden, but you know this guy knows and this guy doesn't. So when they both look back and they point, are you more likely to listen to the guy who knows than the guy who doesn't know? And if you recall, what happened with kids is that they couldn't do this task. When both people were pointing, they automatically just followed the pointing. But they were much better at it when then there was not a pointing, but some other cue. In that case, they could figure it out. So that's the human results. We want to see whether or not dogs show the same pattern. We know they follow pointing, but can they override it? Are they stuck on pointing in the same way as humans? And so we just did a dog-centric version of the same sort of task. Um, we had humans in this room who were pointing at different objects and, or could use these little cues to set things up. That's what the setup looked like. And here was what the different experimental conditions were. We had some dogs who went through a pointing condition. So they saw exactly what you saw with the pointing, like that. We had other dogs, uh, and, and of course the key element here is that one guy is gonna know where the information is, but the other guy doesn't know. So do the dogs follow the guy that knows, or like humans, are they at chance? 
We also had a case where we had these little marker conditions. So now it's the same kind of thing. One guy knows and one guy doesn't. But they're signaling what they know with the marker, which for kids was a little bit easier because it didn't involve the pointing. But we also were worried that maybe dogs just didn't know what was going on at all. So we did both a condition where these objects, in each case, were visible to the dogs. So now they know need somebody's help. They can see where the food was hidden themselves. So this should be really easy for dogs. And one that was more like the kid condition where things were hidden. And the question is, do dogs show the same performance as human kids? That's what I'm going to show you in these. Oh, well, first I'll show you the video so you can see kind of what this looks like, so you can get a sense of the setup. Oops. Actually, can I, if the folks are back there, can you try to click on that as a video? Awesome. Oh, maybe the video is not working. Well, anyway, now you can get a sense of the setup. What's going to happen is she's going to take that screen and cover it up, just like you've seen. One of the people is going to turn around. Then she's going to hide the food where no one sees it, turn back, and then they each point or they, they each put the cue. Basically exactly the kind of animation you saw before. All right, so here's the graphs, as I was going to say. Um, the question is what happens across these different conditions, and are dogs like kids? So I'm going to plot how often they go with the person who really knows, right? This is what they're supposed to be doing if they can do the task. And here's what you find on the visible treat, both when the person's pointing and when they're doing the cue, which makes sense. If dogs can see where the food is, they should be awesome at this test, and that's what they're showing. They're awesome at it. So it seems like the task works, the dogs can process it, and so on. What happens when they can't see it and they need to use the cue? And just as a reminder, the kid results would look something like this, where the kids are really bad at doing this when there's pointing, because they can't help but automatically copy this cue, but they're pretty good at the marker condition. What do dogs do? Are they like human kids? Well, the answer is no. They're not like human kids. They're actually doing something that was a pattern that we didn't really expect, where they're kind of bad at the marker condition, but they're pretty good at the pointing conditions. This is exactly the opposite of what humans showed, which was kind of confusing for us. And so, uh, and this is just statistically different, so it wasn't just like a random pattern. This was like a real thing that we were seeing in dogs. And so basically, the upshot is that we were worried that the dogs were doing something strange. They were better at pointing, which was not what we were expecting. So we said, well, let's compare pointing to another case where the person's just reaching for the object. So now maybe it's something weird about that marker task. We're just giving some dogs another case that should be easy for them, just to get a, do a sanity check on our experiments. And so we had a condition that was pointing, same as before. Um, where the person knows or doesn't know, and then we had a condition that was reaching, where you just see somebody reach for it. And it's like, who do you go for if you're paying attention to the reaching? And as again, we had the cases where the dogs could see everything, so it should be super easy, and the ones where everything was hidden. And so these were the results that we saw from before. What happens in the reaching case? Well, they're great in the visible condition, which is a good sanity check. They're awesome at it. What happens in this case? Well, it kind of just looks like pointing. And this was confusing for us because, remember, we thought pointing was going to be the worst thing if dogs were like humans. Like, pointing is still the best thing. It's almost as though you see the person actually reaching for it, which is kind of strange. So what does this mean? It means that even though dogs are awesome at taking on social cues, they don't seem to be automatically doing this in the way that we expect it, or at least not automatically doing it in the way that humans are. They're not automatically so drawn to a point that they can't override it. It's suggesting they're doing something different than us, which is cool. Even though they want to follow our gaze and share our perspectives, they aren't stuck on our perspective in the same way that humans would be with one another. And so that asked us to sort of think, well, what are other cases where we could test whether or not dogs are automatically showing these things? And so we went to this phenomenon of over-imitation. Are dogs also imitating what we do automatically? Jumping back to over-imitation. And again, this is work done with Angie, that a student I mentioned before, as well as Paul Holden, uh, who is an undergraduate student at Yale. And what we tried to do was to create a dog-friendly version of that little puzzle box you saw before. Dogs aren't as awesome at, at picking up sticks and sticking them into little openings on the top. Um, and so we made a slightly simpler dog version of this box. Um, this is a box where if you want to get something inside of that plexiglass container, you have to lift the red lid, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get in. The thing you don't have to do is move or do anything with that stick. It's just a stick that's sticking into nothing. It doesn't really do anything. But you might be trained on how to open this by a person who shows you that moving the stick is the thing to do. And that's just what we did with dogs. Here's Angie showing the dogs how to open this box. She says, hey, puppy, look. She wiggles the stick for a long time. And then she opens this red lid um, to try to get inside and get the food. Right? So dogs seeing that while a person, when they open it, do this irrelevant thing, our dog is going to copy it. Are they going to over imitate and imitate a little bit too much? Um, I think this is supposed to be a video. Let's see if it actually works. Yeah. 
So here's Paul showing Pixis, who's one of our dogs, how to do it. You can see he does the irrelevant thing, but then also does the relevant thing. Closes it up. And then just as in the kids' studies, he's going to leave. And the question is whether or not Pixis imitates that irrelevant thing. Does she mess with the stick? Basically, you're going to see the results, which is the answer is no. No over-imitation at all. And so what that suggests is that dogs are also not over-imitating. They're not automatically copying our pointing, and they're not automatically copying our imitation, which incidentally means that dogs are actually a little bit more rational about following our cues than humans are with one another, which is kind of interesting in its own right. But all this goes to say, we start off with this question of, is this automatic mind sharing, this mind meld that we have to connect with others, is it special to humans? And when we go back to dogs, we see, well, on the one hand, at least in terms of the, what we can control, it seems like this tendency is not unique to humans. It seems like dogs do want to share with us. They are capable of sharing with us. They're capable of following pointing in a way that seems to be different than even our closest living relatives. But the other thing we found is that it doesn't seem to be automatic. If we really think about the automaticity, dogs don't seem to do the same thing as humans do. And so with that, we'll kind of wind up. You know, I started with this question of why are humans so weird and pointed out all these weird things that we did. And I came up with this kind of new proposal. And the proposal was different because it wasn't proposing that humans do something that's like really smart. It was proposing that humans do something that's a little bit glitchy. It was proposing that we're doing something that kind of is dumb some of the time. And that dumb thing is that we seem to not have a human unique smart capacity, but we have one that's glitchy and kind of dumb. And as you probably got, it's dumb in part because we're melding with other individuals, not just when we want to, but all the time, all the time, without thinking about the consequences or whether or not it's a good idea to meld with somebody at any point. And it's the automaticity of this mind meld that worries me about humans. We're kind of constantly doing it without any filter. And we're interested in whether or not other species had this, this automatic tendency to share our reality with others. And it's the automaticity part that seems amazing in human children, where it emerges even within the first year of life and controls whether they can follow pointing and all these things. And what we found is that that automatic tendency seems to not even, not even the automatic part of it, but any of this tendency doesn't seem to be present in our closest living relatives. But some of it seems to be present in domesticated dogs. However, domesticated dogs seem to in some ways be more sophisticated than humans in their ability to share with others because they know when they should do it and when they shouldn't. They don't do it when we imitate, they don't imitate when they need to do it in a dumb way. And they don't pay attention to our pointing when our pointing is irrelevant. They're not automatically um, following our pointing in a way that messes them up. It seems oddly like dogs are more rational about the moments where they mind well than even humans are. And so with that, we kind of go back to this notion that human mind sharing seems to be automatic. And at least with this best test case we have of turning to domesticated dogs, it might in fact be unique to our species, which kind of means we're dumb in some ways that we don't expect. But it also might be that at least some of this automatic mind sharing, the fact that we're kind of constantly copying the action of others, while it might be a dumb cognitive mechanism, it could lead perhaps to some of the cool kinds of things that humans do down the line. Things like teaching and sharing minds in fiction, and sharing minds in science, and all these other cultural activities. What started with a dumb glitchy capacity might be one of the strange things that oddly makes us smart. Um, and with that, I will end and thank all the students who did all the hard work and open it up for questions. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I love that question. So the question was like, would it really be considered dumb? Because it's probably like helping us find food and do these kinds of things. I think as a cognitive capacity, it's in some ways like, we could call it dumb, right? Like when you saw the dots on the screen, it's kind of dumb that you're messed up by this person like who's just randomly on there. But if you think about it evolutionarily, it might actually be a really smart capacity. Um, so in Hal's talk, you mentioned these mechanisms that are proximate, which are kind of like what the cognition is doing, like how the cognitive mechanism works. And it seems like it's really dumb. It just has this thing like, just turn on and don't ever shut off. Like if you see a point, just follow it. It doesn't matter if it's good or not. Like if you see somebody do something, just copy it. It doesn't matter. Like there's no filter. That seems so silly. 
But from an ultimate perspective, when you think evolutionarily, that dumb mechanism might have gotten us really far, because it might mean that we're really good at copying in all these kinds of situations. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to decide, should I copy in this case? Like, should I not? Like, we just kind of get the information from others for free. And if you think about a lot of the domains in which humans might be special, things like the fact that we teach, or the fact that we learn all these different cultural practices, some of which are really hard to understand the reasoning behind and so on, now you start to see that we might be using this really dumb mechanism to do something evolutionarily that's really quite smart. Um, and that is a really powerful thing about humans. The crazy thing when you turn to dogs, and one of the reasons I love the dog studies, is dogs got the ability to copy when they needed it, but they didn't have the glitch of never being able to override it which is kind of powerful. It suggests that the recent domestication we've seen is allowing, us to, is allowing dogs to kind of get the benefits of the mind meld without any of the consequences, which is pretty cool. Other questions? Yeah. So um, cognitive distortions, are they prominent in dogs and other um, like types of creatures, I guess? And you think that could have some sort of effect on the tests that you're doing when it comes to like understanding how things work, yeah. such as the box thing on how it opens and how to get the thing inside of it. Do you think that could ca cause some sort of problem in how they resolve the problem, how they figure it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a couple of pieces to that question. So one is like when, you, when dogs and, and non-human primates and stuff, when they think about the box, what do they understand? And one critical thing is that when you do that control condition, when you don't have anybody teaching them anything, all of those other species can figure out how to do it. So at a dog, if he, hit, he didn't see the person do it, all of a sudden they would know how to do it ahead of time. So we know that for sure. Um, but this question about whether or not we see other cognitive distortions in animals is, I think, a really interesting one. Um, and it's one of the reasons I start to talk with this, these, those ideas at the, head, at the start, which are like, one thing that makes humans special is we have language, and we have cooperation, and we have all these things. I think one thing that might make humans special is that in a lot of domains, we have these interesting cognitive distortions that other species might not have at all. Um, and not in this work, but in other work, my lab has looked at whether or not other animals share some of the cognitive distortions or cognitive biases we have in other domains. We've looked at whether or not other animals share some of our economic biases, um, the biases we have with money. The fast answer is they do in some domains, but not all of them. Um, we've looked at whether or not animals share our ability to rationalize our behavior. The answer is sometimes, but not all the time. Um, so my read of the literature is that one thing that might make us special is that we actually have these cognitive biases that mess with our behavior that might be lacking in other animals. Um, and getting back to the other question, it might be that we have those biases that look dumb at the proximate level, but evolutionarily at the ultimate level, they're actually doing something that seems a little bit smarter. Oh, yeah, help. Yeah. <clears throat> so the question was about, um, you know, all the dogs we tested were pet dogs, right? You know, couldn't we really understand canids who might not live in those kinds of situations? And what about primates who grew up with humans and stuff? The primate question, I think, is tricky because unlike domesticated dogs, who even those street dogs have the genetic changes that would allow them to be with the humans, non-human primates don't have that. They're all just wild. And so having them grow up with humans, my guess is that it would A, be a bad idea kind of ethically, and B, would be potentially problematic in that they just don't have the mechanisms like domestication that would allow them to pick up on that information. But on the canid side, I think that's a really interesting question. Like, how much of the kinds of patterns we're seeing in the successes of dogs, of reading our gaze, following, pointing, and so on, is the fact that over ontogeny, so over development, they grow up with us, versus like, you know, it's just what's built in from the start. And to test one of those questions, we haven't turned to these like more feral dogs or these um, or kind of street dogs. We've actually turned to a different non-domesticated or a kind of partially domesticated canid. We've been working with Australian dingoes, um, which kind of on the path is sort of you have kind of wolves over here, which are canids that aren't domesticated at all. Then dingoes kind of started on the path to domestication and then sort of went feral. Um, and so that's been the outgroup that we've been using to try to test claims about 
domestication, in part because the dingo population we work with, which is a sanctuary in Melbourne, Australia, they've grown up around humans. So they have a lot of interaction with humans, they just don't have the domestication side. And one of the funny things about the over-imitation study, I didn't mention this when I presented it, is that um, when we started this work, we so believed that dogs would show this over-imitation effect that we, in addition to testing dogs, also tested dingoes because we thought we'd see a difference where dogs would over-imitate like humans, they would have this automatic mind meld, and dingoes would not. Um, we started the dingo work first, which as you can imagine is like expensive. We got to fly to Australia and set all these things up. And we found what we expected with dingoes, which is they don't over-imitate. And then we finally we went back to dogs and we're like, wait, they don't over-imitate either. <laughs> and so we tried to publish this paper where they were the same. And, and the reviewers were like, well, why did you test dingoes? And we're like, if the dogs didn't do it. And it was like, I know, it was dumb. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't know it was dumb. We don't. Sometimes you don't know. You have hypotheses. Um, yeah, so, but I actually think that uh, testing, so that's kind of testing Non, not fully domesticated canids that have human experience. We have to do the other cell where we test you know, fully domesticated dogs who just haven't had the ontogenetic experience that most pet dogs have had, and I think that would be really cool. Um, the prediction, though, is that given that these pet dogs who have the domestication and the ontogeny aren't really showing the effects, my guess is we'll get a lot of similarity. Like, these pet dogs are really the best test case to see if they're automatically sharing in the same way as humans, and given that they don't, my guess is that the street dogs will show the same thing, but it would be really cool to test just to see for sure. Good question. So we, we put gender into all of our models, um, and we tend not to see any gender difference. You mean gender differences in dogs, like sex differences in the dogs, right? In the humans, yeah. So you tend, you see a funny effects in some of these kinds of cases. Um, the most prominent effect in some of the over imitation work isn't with gender. It's about neurotypical uh, versus uh, potentially like kids on the spectrum. What you find is that kids on the spectrum look a lot more like dogs on those, in these kinds of tasks. So they can copy and they can imitate when they need to, but they can also shut it off. So it seems like one thing that might be different um, for non-neurotypical kids is that kids on the spectrum um, can copy and they can imitate, but they don't have a tendency to do that automatically. And so they can shut it off. So in a funny way, that's a, a domain in social functioning where autistic kids look more rational than human children. Um, but gender differences you tend not to see. The, the one caveat to that is that um, typically when we do these studies with human kids or even with dogs, we're not using big enough samples and almost any study in cognition where you see gender differences, you see them in part because you use such a big sample that you can see. Um, even in cases like of spatial reasoning, which is a domain where people tend to see big gender differences, um, those are really overlapping bell curves. So if you look at women's performance, it looks like this. If you look at men's performance, it's just, you know, there's difference at the peak, but you couldn't just decide from anybody's performance where they are. And statistically, to see differences there, you have to have big samples so you can see these big distributions. We pretty rarely see big samples like that when we're dealing with cognition behavior in the dogs. Um, I have to be very jealous of Hal's, you know, 16 million <laughs> dogs. But I even have to be jealous of his, you know, when you mentioned 100 dogs or 1,000 dogs, I was like, ooh, even that sounds like very fantasy land for us. So, um, yeah. Has your work changed the way you teach? That's a great question. Um, so has my work changed the way I teach? I think what it's made me realize is that we have these very automatic tendencies to soak in information that we as teachers don't often recognize when we're teaching other individuals and when we're training others. And I think it's made me more cognizant that subtle ways that I phrase things or do things, like my students might pick up more automatically than I expect. You know, oftentimes as teachers, we think, oh, students will have a critical eye, you know, they'll have a good filter, da, da, da. But like this work suggests that that's not the case. Um, it's also made me more critical as a consumer of social information writ large. Um, you know, when I see the results of that altercentric interference study, like, you, you're just like watching some 2D guy on the screen and you're influenced by the number of dots he sees. You know, think of the world we live in where we get social information on social media and so on. You know, how many times have you scrolled through your, I don't know what your Facebook feed looks like, but you know, my families have, across the, my, my friend group, very different political views, very different views on all kinds of things. And the claim is like, as I'm scrolling through those, you know, if these experiments are right, it suggests that other people's views are just like getting in there faster than I think and without a filter. And that's a kind of really scary prospect. I think we don't know as much. You know, we assume that we have good filters on these things, and we can shut those off, obviously, but there might be more getting in from copying other people's perspectives and behaviors than we really think. Um, and that's caused me to be slightly more careful about how I consume other people's information out there in the world. 
I'm not seeing, it's hard to actually see with the light up here, but I'm not seeing any other hands. So, oh, one more, yeah. Um, it's, it's had its pluses and its minuses, as you might expect. I don't get a nice suntan when I'm out working um, with the dogs. Uh, no, I think, I think one, of the most, one of the most fantastic things about working with dogs, um, working with pet dogs in particular that I didn't anticipate, is the interaction that you get with the dog's companions and their owners. Um, and what I mean by that is that the owners are just these individuals who are so excited about learning more about their dogs, and they're so curious. And when we do these canine cognition studies, we have this wonderful possibility of engaging with citizen science in a way that I didn't expect, where you're really working with owners who are learning about the science as you do it. You know, we constantly have cases where people will bring their whole families in to come do these kind of canine cognition studies where they're, you know, five, like four-year-old kids who we're kind of explaining, you know, well, we have to do that condition where it's hidden because we need to control and make sure the dog didn't see it. You know, we're kind of talking through the scientific method as we're doing these studies. And it makes us feel like, particularly in the community in New Haven where we live, where there's, you know, really diverse income levels, really diverse educational backgrounds, like we're doing a lot of science scientific training in that community. I didn't realize that was going to be a component of this work, but it's been an incredibly fun and an incredibly rewarding part. Um, I'm just you know, trying to figure out what dogs know so I can figure out what humans know, but it was really cool to see the kind of scientific engagement we'd see in a community when you tap into people's curiosity about you know, their dogs. They want to know how that mind works. All right, I think that's a great question to end on for lunch. Thank you all so much. We'll see you soon. <laughs>